from the rain-drenched shores of the North Saskatchewan River right here in Prince Albert. This is Jack Antonio today for Do You Know Jack, the podcast. And on the line with me is the man, myth, and slash or legend himself, Corky Lang. Of course, many will know him from being the guy that's slapping the skins in Mountain. But there's so much more, so many layers to this man. He's like an onion. You just got to keep peeling and peeling. <laughs> How are you doing, Corky? <laughs> Bonjour, bonjour, Monsieur Jacques. Uh, Jacques, how you doing? Uh, yeah, I like the onion metaphor. That's good as long as long as it doesn't have the. Well, I love onions, <laughs> so that's good. And they do make you cry, you know, when you cut them. So that that's true. Uh, but it's a it's a pleasure to be back in Canada with you. Yeah. And, uh, as you as you know by the book Letters to Sarah, I grew up in Montreal. I wouldn't call it growing up, but I. I uh, I had a, a wonderful life, an initial musical life, and in Canada, across yeah. Canada, and uh, I've passed by your way many times in the middle of a snowstorm, and, uh, <laughs> you know. So I, I do recognize the rooftops in some of these places. Yeah, yeah. Well, I definitely want to talk uh, about the book, but I mean, I guess first and foremost, I think you're you're just coming back from uh, a little uh, trip through uh, Europe, uh, in particular Germany. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, we uh, took a quick, uh, we did a festival. Oddly enough, uh, Jack, they, they're celebrating this Woodstock thing over there, too. We're what? Honest, we're, we're, yeah, it's it's amazing. Well, you know, it's the 50th anniversary That's true. of Woodstock, from what I understand, and I still have a pulse. Again, most of the people, I'm sorry to say, are dirt now. Yeah. But the point is, is that in the States, they have legends of Woodstock, you know, touring these different festivals across the country. Uh, some of them are good and some of them are chaotic. But, I, I, you know, it's just, I don't know about trying to, you know, uh, reconstruct the vibe of Woodstock. To me, it's like the first time you get laid, you know, you never forget it. But it yeah. doesn't mean the bet. It's a moment in time that I don't think could be simulated later on and later on. I mean, the music part, yeah, it's wonderful. But, you know, I think they're reaching out a little bit far for it. Yeah. And I think yeah. the people that are going to come to the show will enjoy it. I mean, I personally love playing the mountain repertoire because of mountain being at Woodstock. So we're, you know, we're having a great time with that. And I, uh, But then we get calls to go to East Berlin. And I'm saying, what does East Berlin have to do with Woodstock? But of course, uh, who shows up 10 years after the, you know, Rick Oh, wow. And, and uh, it was good. It was really good. They, they loved it. I, couldn't understand a word in English because this is East Berlin, you know, yeah, it's not as cos cosmopolitan. So there I am rambling on about little stories here and there, and they're looking at me going, uh, excuse me, what is he talking about, you know? And uh, so we did get it across, and then they we're going back in October for a month to play all over Germany. Now they love they love that era, you know, they really do. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm 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 a Gen Xer, so I mean, I'm I'm the child of of you know people that are from that era, right? And I I grew up, uh, you know, for a good portion of my life hearing how my parents could have went, but for whatever reason they never ended up going. My dad even just recently told me the story again about how he was the guy with the car. And they were just gonna. <laughs> there you go. They were just yeah. gonna hop in the car and and drive out there. Uh, you know, tickets be damned, which obviously thousands of people did. You know, it was yeah. a big gate crashing festival. Um, but you know, he he decided not to because he was just uh, you know dating um, or maybe newly married to my mother oh, at I the see. time, and my mother yeah. couldn't get the time off, and it. Are even... you, wait a second. Let's let's rewind. Are you talking about driving from Saskatchewan? No. My my parents, uh, my my dad is a Dutch immigrant who moved to London, Ontario for work. So they were from there. So I, I'm not sure how far of a drive London would be from it's New York. It's a long one. But... Yeah, it's a, it's a 15 hour drive. I've done it from Toronto. And I used to teach at University of Western Ontario. So I know London. And uh, of course, I taught in the wintertime. So that uh -huh. was my experience. But um, it's a drive. Yeah. It's a, it, it's a drive. But you know what? 
Um, you can see the movie, I guess, these days. And I mean, festivals every two minutes now. So the festival is the gathering of people with the same sort of uh, musical, uh, you know, agenda. So it's all good. It's just it's categorized now, which is yeah. very unique. You know, La Palooza, Coachella, and stuff. So um, it's become very corporate, uh, and I don't think you know. Um, maybe the the people who booked and and tried to run Woodstock had a bit of. I mean, they obviously wanted to make money, but I, it's I all mean, about, it's all about money, yeah. You know, and and I'm I'm sure in the end because of the film, of course, they made it at least maybe made their money back. I don't know. I mean, I I've never looked at the the stats before, but I would imagine they've sort of managed to do that over time, and maybe you know, a, a pretty sizable profit as well but i mean well you see you just have to take a look at the music business what's left of it right now yeah. and it's all about everybody just it's all about greed and i'm sorry to say that you know i'm still very thrilled to get up and play my drums because i love to play of course and i still try i just try to do it and you just don't count on the money anymore whether you're trying to pay a mortgage or you're trying to pay, you know, for your cigars. It yeah. doesn't make a difference. The point is that you got to love to play. You know, you're a musician. That's what you do. And yeah. these days, all you do get paid for is to travel. So you mentioned I just got back from overseas. And, and, and I, it's tiring, you know. And, of course, flying these days is absolutely ridiculous. Yes. So um, over the years, everything has changed. But you go with it. You go with it. And um, that's that's what it's all about for me. Yeah, just go for it. And just try to get better yeah. and better and better. And, uh, yeah, that's my agenda. Well, there's about two or three things there that I definitely want to unpack just from that short statement you made. But, but I mean, you know, going back now, I mean, of course, I don't want to fixate on the money aspect. But to, to some industry pundits, and I mean, what the fuck do they know? But, I mean, Mississippi Queen is probably one of the biggest albatrosses in, in the history of the music business, right? I mean, are you still collecting decent royalty checks from, it, from I that? I have to say, it's a financial pleasure. Yes, it is. Uh, listen, I started in the, in, in the music industry. I was, like, it was, I think it was my bar mitzvah, whatever it was. And I remember, I remember just playing and people watching me, and I love that part, you know? It's, yeah. it's, it's an addiction. And the thing is, is that when I started, it was pop. And it was pop music. And pop was the sound you heard when you put r milk in Rice Krispies. That's what pop was until they invented the bass guitar, the electric bass. Yeah. Then you were, then the drummer was able to start hitting, you know. And then you had bands like the Kinks when you had a backbeat, you know, from one of those songs. You go, wait a second, what is that that's kicking me in the ass? And it's the snare drum. Things like that, and that's what developed. And then, of course, you have the bass up and the drummer, and then you got hard rock. Yeah. I feel like giving, giving a history lesson here. <laughs> but I, I'm thrilled to say I was part of every decade only because I lived through it. And, you know, you do what you got to do. But Mississippi Queen and, and the Mountains record and that took a sleigh ride, it stemmed the time, and it's wonderful. And, of course, over in Europe, they love it. They don't. Yes. There's no, no big radio stations there anymore. You have BBC One, BBC Two. Right. So the people that love what they love from the '60s, if they're still around, they still got ears. They really call upon these bands to come over there. Yeah. That's why a lot of bands, heavy rocks, a lot of Canadian bands over there. You know, tragically, have been, they go over to Europe. Yeah. Of and that's course, because. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's because they still have money. Of course, with Brexit, who knows what's going to go down. Yeah. But the point is, it's wonderful the way it is right now, and we hope to keep it going. But yes, I'm happy to say uh, <laughs> the, the queen the queen rules. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard, I mean, the song's been covered umpteen million times over the years. One of the more recent and memorable ones, of course, is Ozzy's uh, cover. I mean, have you... I, I would hope maybe that you've heard that cover, and did you have any contact with Ozzy at the I time? I did. No, actually, I, I was there when they, when he recorded. Leslie oh, wow. West played on on that one. He, uh -huh. he, yeah, Ozzy, Ozzy. Uh, listen, Black Sabbath. They love. We were the only band that put them on our package when we were cooking in the seventies. Uh, uh, was a Frank Barcelona, who was the huge agent at the time. You know, he was given this band from England. He says he could, none of the promoters would touch uh, a Black Sabbath. They yeah. thought they were cult, and they're the sweetest guys in the world. So we put them 
on our Texas tour, which, as you know, is the Bible Belt. Yeah. And, and I couldn't believe how they handled it. These people were screaming, throwing shit at them. They didn't give a damn. You know, Ozzy just walked around, total confidence. And we became friends as bandmates, you know. And, mm-hmm. uh, yes, I do remember him recording it. And, yes, that was a final. You know what they did, though, Jack, which pissed me off the credits on the prince of darkness which is the album he's on the song is on they got the credits wrong oh no yeah billy joe mcpherson or something they had a country singer so wherever it's sony who was going through the credits they here we get an amazing cover and they got the credits wrong and of course they say oh i'm so sorry we'll, we'll fix it on the next batch well they've already printed a half a million copies <laughs> i don't know if there is a second batch yeah. but i mean those are some of the things that go down in the business when you got a lot of juniors doing the job anyway so that's not a great story but <laughs> give, me, give me some more questions I know, <laughs> I know you're a great editor who's ever does your editing by the way is brilliant oh well that's me you do that because that's that's not easy shit and it's very very tight i enjoyed that okay so much for the compliments okay you mentioned of course you had a you've, you've had a book come out i think it was maybe Sunday, May twelfth, and and there's a good reason for that because that was this past Mother's Day, and and your book, your your memoir, your autobiography, Letters to Sarah, has come out. Uh, I, I guess you know the operative question is why the book and why now, and of course the other question is uh, you know you've already sort of released a couple of different books. One was with Leslie, I think, and there was another one that you sort of did on your own. So uh, yeah, you know yeah, that's those. Yeah, those those are a couple of the books that I referred to. Happened in capsule form. I was working on this uh, rock opera uh-huh. with, these, with these Finnish professors called Playing God, uh-huh. and we were working here in, in South Hold, New York. What had happened previous months before? My uh, my brothers sent me down the boxes of all my mother's things, so I put it in a storeroom. I didn't even look at it. But as we're rehearsing, uh, Tuja Takala who was the writer of the of the opera, was walking around while we were rehearsing, and she found the box of letters. I didn't know my mother saved these letters. I would have, I, ri- I wrote them way back when I was locally playing Quebec and all the tertiary markets around Ontario, etc. cetera. And um, uh, I would get lonely, Jack. Yeah. And uh, I decided, well, if I wasn't writing music, I would write letters to my mom and tether myself to the family. I came from a beautiful family. I have triplet brothers. I have sister. So to me, it's like I was the baby in the family, so I had to hang in there. Yeah. So who's ever listening, if you're the baby in the family, you don't want to be forgotten. So I would do that every show. And so there was like 250 letters that she saved. And I didn't know anything about it. So Tuya, uh, the writer of this opera, found these letters. She says, well, wait a second. This is like these, this is like a window of time. So we, she says, why don't we use the letters? And it's like, again, instead of writing a typical memoir, how many times I got laid and this, how much <laughs> drugs I took. Instead of doing that, she's a, she's an academic writer. She said, let's write a proper book. I went, well, I don't know, a proper book and rock and roll. She says, let me help you out. So she she take the letters and she put picked them out. And there were dates all the way up until my mother passed away over 30 years. Yeah. And it made sense to do it that way. I never thought of it that way. And quite frankly, Jack, I had no intention of writing a book, but it, this was more of a co-write. Yeah. So over three or four years, I'd go to Finland, I'd go back and forth doing different different jobs and different gigs. And um, we, we developed the book. And uh, uh, Kinky Freeman, a good friend of mine, uh, heard about it and he read it. And he's a writer. He's a writer as well. He's a very funny guy. Yeah. But uh, he did the foreword. And as a result of the foreword, there's, you know, people help you. You get the support of certain people. Levon Helm, one of my favorite people, said, listen, let me write a little statement on the book and then uh who is it peter chris from kiss uh, you know you meet these people i said well come on say something and they did so i gotta say i'm very very honored that you get these sort of mini endorsements and sure enough the response has been great including yourself by the way it's great to talk to somebody in another canuck about <laughs> it because usually the canadians are a little more sophisticated and i sound like a schmooze it may sound like a promo slot but the point is the point is it's it's great it's great to have a prop and i hope um i hope whoever it's i think whoever you know reads it it's 
it's a, a I, I would call it a sort of a window of life yes. that I had in Canada, especially in Montreal, during some turbulent years with the FLQ, etc. So it's not your typical thing about, you know, um, how I made it or this and that. It's a, it's a personal thing that, and thoughts that I had. And for the people that enjoy it, great. I mean, I have to say, Jack, a couple of interviews I did with some of the techs and stuff, they're pretty heavy-handed, you know. And, and they, the guy would say, you know, Chapter 3, I started to cry. <laughs> and it went, this is not a Roy Orbison. You don't have to cry. But he, it was really funny, the effect yeah. that it had on some people. And it's, I'm, I'm delighted with the reception. And that's all I'm going to say about the book in terms of hyping it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, I was. By, think- by the way, you can order <laughs> you can order on Amazon right now. Forty. <laughs> That's right. Well, I was going to say now the letters are something that really make this book unique. I mean, when you saw this box of letters that were magically found, I mean, you know, what was your initial reaction? Because. I mean, you know, I, I think as a as a son myself, there's a certain relationship that you have with with a mother, right? Like that that mo- your mother, she'll always when you see her, like it, you could be like 50 years old, and she would start straightening your shirt or you know trying to fiddle with your tie if you happen to be wearing one, you know. So I mean, how did you react when you when you saw the letters uh, right there in front of you? Well, that's a great question. I, I had a lot of different thoughts because the letters were over years. Yes. And I was going through some wonderful times, and I went through some terrible times. My mother was generally worried about getting caught up in the drug and the whole drug thing. She, and my dad was worried that I drink too much beer and stuff. And, uh, you know, it didn't work out one way or the other, you know, ups and downs. But they were very supportive. While well, my dad was alive, he, you know, he, he's the one that said... Uh, uh, Laurie, if you if you want to find out how good you are, you got to go to a place where they know what good is, what great is. Yes, you got to get your ass to New York because if you you know it's funny, if you ain't got that swing, forget it. Yeah, and uh, so I did. I managed to you know cajole myself with with a visa with some friends, and we get we got down to the Peppermint Lounge way way back. Yes, and uh, and you know we thought, wow, it's going to be great. We're going to dance. It'll be like the Peppermint Lounge. You know the Beatles hung out there. And we go there, and it's a funky little gay club now, you know, where it was. <laughs> yes. So we said, we, well, we were all dressed up in these Robin Hood outfits that we called ourselves Bartholomew Plus Three yes. at the time. And it, was a, it wasn't a major act in Canada, but we, we, we made a little noise on Go Go 66 and, you know, those little shows that they had uh, in Montreal. And um, we had these uniforms. And... The gay people loved us, and we were playing uh, with John and Johnny Maestro on the Crests. Remember? Yeah. You know, Sixteen Candles, great song. Anyways, he was sort of he was sort of our our uh, our, our our security there because he was you know I mean this Forty Second Street or Forty Eighth Street. It was pretty heavy in New York in the late sixties, but we loved it. We loved it because we knew that was the grit. You know that those were the trenches. Those were the five thousand hours that we did. And, of course, at that time, I did run into Leslie West. Yeah. He was playing in a band called The Vagrants. Anyway, so a lot was happening at that time. And, you know, coming from Montreal and going down there, and, of course, all the musicians at that time were saying, man, the only thing you do, you got to cross the border. It was a big deal to cross the border and go to New York or to go to Buffalo, whatever. And uh, that was that was a bit of a challenge for a lot of musicians on you. You know, you get bands like the Tragically Hip and a lot of bands up there and uh, the Cowboy Junkies. They're great. And, and, and it, for some reason, they didn't break through in certain areas, except if they did the colleges. Yeah, and that was that was the that was the, uh, the the agenda was to get into the universities, which they did. And they made some noise. I went down on my own. So it was kind of uh, different. You know, I hooked up, and when Mountain came together, I was a member, and, you know, I, yeah, it was a four-letter word. You know, it starts with L, not with F. But luck, I had a lot of luck. Yeah. And that's what you got. That's what you got to have in this business. For sure. I, I thought it was quite endearing, too, that several of the letters, especially the early ones, uh, you know, you're talking to your mom about, you know, making uh, deposits and even, you know, here I've set aside $50 for you. I mean, <laughs> that's that, that's such a, uh, you know, a, 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 like I said, you know, a few minutes ago, that's such a son thing to do. Yeah, it is. Well, I 
was, again, I was, I was the fifth, sixth child. And our house, and we had about nine people living in this house, you know, on Marcel Avenue in NDG in, in Montreal. Lower middle class, but my father busted his ass, and my mom, you know, she was in shit. So everybody was doing what they did. My brothers happened to be great hockey players, but they also, everybody had a chore in the house. And I was never around because on the weekends I'd be out playing Italian weddings or whatever I could. And um, uh, I was away a lot. And yeah, you know, I, I miss the family. And especially after those years, it was, um, you come to really, you know, home is a freedom in itself. You know, when you're on the road, you think you're free. You're not really free. You know, you are, you are trapped in some sort of addiction to playing or whatever. It's not the same thing. So I always think of home as that, metaphorically, that's where you're free to yeah. do it. And I never wanted to lose that connection to that. And that's why I did write, I believe, because I was never confident. You know, I didn't, I'm going to be the rock guy. I never had that feeling. I just love to play. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, it's in the book, but in the late 60s, when they had the British invasion, our manager in Montreal was a guy named Steve Cooper, and he, his father ran the forum. He did all the Dick Clark shows, the caravans that came up, and so we were managed by him. So we were put to open the shows, because you remember you had to have a Canadian artist when you have an international show, and we were the Canadian artists at the time, opening for The Who, for Cream, for you know Hendrix, and, and it was great, because we had, this is the first tour that these guys did. Yeah. So Clapton, was, Clapton wasn't God. As a matter of fact, in, in Canada, I don't have to tell you, you didn't hear about certain bands until they broke wide open in the States. So when Hendrix played, and we had a place on Cote d'Ange at Montreal, a rehearsal place that we had 24-7. We were able to go in there any time in this garage and play. And, you know, when the English guys came over, they were they were pretty psyched, you know, and they, they had these special soul pills they'd go for three, four days. So they just wanted to play, so we had a chance to jam, if you use that word, to play with these guys. Like Hendrix didn't, he didn't want to get off the stage. <laughs> he needed a place to keep playing. So sure enough, he'd come down to our to our rehearsal and yeah. you know just start pick up the guitar and you know George the bass player get on play with him. It was a wonderful time again before these guys became stars. You know before this was their first tour, Stones included. You know, and uh, I think it's all in the book, so I don't want to yeah want to be a spoiler. But the point is, is that again, um, a lot of luck, a yeah. lot of luck. Well, I was going to say now, just as a general comment, that, I mean, you know, for most of the book, you know, you're sort of in orbit over so many of these legendary figures. I mean, you know, you mentioned Hendrix. He comes up in the book even fairly early on. I mean, he's right there. And, and I mean, you know, maybe you mentioned this in the book and, and maybe you don't, but I mean, when he passed, where were you and how did you find out? Oh. Actually, we were on tour. I mean, we, we were in Detroit at the time. And I think a month or two before, I think Janis Joplin had bit the dust too. And uh, there was about a few, a year or two with Jim Morrison, there was a few in a row. Yeah. You know, these are, these are our brothers and sisters, you know, who were going for the big one, you know, and maybe they made it and they crashed afterwards, whatever. But a wonderful thing about the, the business these days, I shouldn't say the business, the, you know, the, um, uh, the computer thing and the whole network and is that you can you can pick up all these songs there's no forgetting them you know they're right there when you want them yeah and that's kind of nice you know you don't necessarily have to go to a, uh, a record store which i highly advise people to continue to do but the basically um yeah it was it, it, in those days you really pushed hard you didn't know where the rock machine was going to take you you know, to me, that was the metaphor for Nantucket Sleigh Ride. Felix and I and Gail, we talked about it. And, you know, you're, the Nantucket Sleigh Ride is the ride that these whalers took when they hit a whale. They harpoon a whale, and a whale would take them on this ride you know, uh -huh. over the waves, and the, the whale would sometimes dive, and it would take the boat down. So these whalers, uh, you know, it was similar to a band just jumping on in those days, not know, not knowing where you were going to go. You just had to go in order to get the big one, meaning the big record, whether it was an album or what. 
And, uh, yeah, we lost a lot of our brothers and sisters because of that ride. But we don't forget. It's just um, it's just different now in a way. And um, I don't think it's bad or better or whatever. It's just everything changes. Like, even the changes change, you know. <laughs> and uh, i got to tell you, it's fun. No matter what, as long as the currency is fun, we're in shape. And that's what I was telling you at the beginning off the recording is that when I saw you, I went, this son of a bitch is having a good time. <laughs> and that's, you know, and I've done a million interviews, and a lot of them have been great. And But, I mean, every now and then you get a sourpuss, you know, who says, what does this guy know, you know, who does he think he is? You know, that kind of attitude. Listen, I'm not, you know, I'm not there to, uh, to, to philosophize. But if you're going to be in this business on any level, whatever format, come on, don't get too serious, you know. Of course, and, yeah. Um, and I got to tell you, you're a great editor. I said that. You know. <laughs> well, right on, man. I, I guess uh, you know, just before I uh, before I let you go here, I mean, there's a couple of uh, you know records that have released just in the last few months or so. Of course, you know, uh, there's the Pompeii Secret Sessions record, which I think was sort of maybe like a re-release. Came out April 13th. Um, yes, yes. A, a lot of absolutely incredible musicians on that and I, I think the story goes that the record label buried this recording and it's just resurfaced in the last few years and and uh, you know you mentioned luck I mean as a listener uh, I feel very fortunate and lucky to uh, you know that that, that record has uh, finally seen the late light of day so uh, you know I suppose the operative word would be congratulations on that. Thank you very much. It's very kind. Yes, I'm very proud of that. That that came out on Record Store Day. Yes. That I knew no, I knew nothing about that. And the company, the friend of mine who did it, said, "Listen, I don't know how I'm going to sell, but we're going to do vinyl, right? This was because it was not a Secret Sessions, which was the original uh, CD that was dropped like a bad transmission way back. And uh, they said, "Can we do?" It? I said, "You know, go ahead." So they said, "Well, Sony said they're going to." press about 300 i said fine fine just give me a couple i'll be very proud to have because it wasn't released on vinyl and of course we're going all the way back to vinyl which i love anyways they ended up selling 1500 they pressed and they sold them out on record store day nice. and i felt a, i felt like a bit of a, a dick i didn't i didn't even know what record store day was but it's a very special day for uh -huh. vinyl collectors you know and yes. uh, so thank you for mentioning that yes uh, and i have to say we do have they put a book on uh, Mother's Day, which we worked on for three or four years. And uh, we have a record coming out called the Toledo Sessions. Yes. It's a record. And that's going to be out in August. And they held it up. It's the same record. They, let's not put too much out there, Cork. You know, just see what happens and make sure the people you talk to get a copy of the, of the record and see what they think. But I appreciate your support very much, Jack. It's very cool. Yeah, well, I was going to mention the Toledo sessions in passing as well. I, I think the press release says late May, but it sounds like it's been pushed up to August now. Yes, it has been. Yes, it has been. And we have the, a box set coming. There's a British company that puts out these box sets of different artists. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that you get artifacts and stuff from the artist. I think Bill Buford put one out and uh, I'm trying to think, oh, John uh, John Anderson and who's the other guy, Era, what's his name, Rick Wakeman, you know, he's putting out these box sets with tons of music and stuff in there, things that, you know, your fan base would want to have. If you've got followers, it's nice to treat them, some, you know, to some unique things. So hopefully that'll come out before we do the European tour. So we'll see what happens, Jack. You know, who knows Jack, right? We know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, of course, now uh, the book is called... Let, let me just put it in a voice. Letters to Sarah, available that's right. now on yeah. Amazon. You know, yes, uh, it, that's all right. I just, uh, again, it's... Um, lot going on in everybody's life i just wish everybody's happy and and god bless the you know the whole universe maybe we'll get through this you know for sure for sure all right uh corky well listen man it's been a pleasure and an honor chatting with you on uh, on do you know jack uh the book is fantastic uh like i said it's a very unique take on you know the autobiography given that you have these letters in your possession that you were able to uh in intersperse throughout the pages uh and i think there's a spoken word version of this that's supposed to be coming out soon as well 
Yeah, you're doing good, Jack. You're, you've been in the business 20 minutes. You're good. <laughs> Get that stuff out. Yes, there's, there is an audio version, of which I'm very happy to say. It was the only time I started to cry, because when you actually read what you write, it's kind of, uh, it could be awkward. Because you go, did I really say that? You know. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, actually, my buddy Levon Helm said, "No, if you're going to do an audio book, use your voice." Yeah. So uh, you know, I'll always give him credit. No problem. <laughs> well, right on. Well, it's been a pleasure and an honor chatting with you today about uh, you know not just your book, but uh, you know all things Corky Lang, man. Uh, much appreciated, and uh, you have a good day, sir. Thank you so much. God bless, Jack. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.